I was at lunch with a group of students, a group of guys, students, when I was a student pastor in Mississippi. And as we were seated at the table, an older gentleman came over to the table. He started scratching his beard. He looked at us. You boys want to become men? I'm like, I know where this is going, and this is not going to be fun for anybody. This is just going to be an awkward conversation. And before I could, I could say anything, there's a test. What you got to do is get on up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And now I'm just curious at this point in time. I'm just curious where this is going. You got to put on some camouflage. What? I'm not from Mississippi, but this is brand new advice to me. <laughs> like, tell me, sensei, how do I become a man? <laughs> so go out in the woods. Hack a mile. Carrying a bow and an arrow. Douse yourself in deer urine. I'm like, what? No. Hard no, hard no. Don't do that. No. <laughs> Climb a tree and just sit and wait. And then when a big old buck appears on the horizon, you put that arrow on that bow and you pull it back. You don't use a gun, boys. Anybody can use a gun. To become a man, you use a bow and an arrow. And just as the sun rises off in the distance, you let that arrow fly. And when you get yourself that buck, and you drag it with your bare hands and some rope a mile out of the woods. That's when you've passed the test. That's when you've become a man. I'm here to report I nor any of the four other boys who are at that table have ever become a man to this day. <laughs> Now, I understand that some of you love to go deer hunting, the allure of getting up at an ungodly hour in the morning, of putting on camouflage, of dousing yourself in animal urine, just strikes a chord within the heart of the inner man, and you're like, this is when I feel like I'm a man. Sorry, it's just never done it for me. And if you, if you want to get yourself a big old deer, here's what you need to do. Forget all of that. Forget the camouflage, all right? Arrive to the church about 5, 5.15. Follow me home, okay? I guarantee we'll see at least three, one of which will stand in the road and we'll have to hit the brakes. We'll honk on the horn. We'll flash the lights. And the real elusive animal that you're climbing up a tree or getting into a deer stand to find will stand in the road long enough for you to go and get the gun out of the bed of the truck or if you're breaking the law, out of your back seat. You can get out of the car. It will just look at you in the middle of the road. You will have time to reload two or three times if you miss. And congratulations, you've got yourself a deer. Save yourself the sleep, sleep in a little bit of time, and just follow me home. It is guaranteed that you will, you will work. You will find yourself a deer, and that way everybody's happy, all right? So just think about that. Now, when I was at lunch, I was presented with a test, as well were the students that were with me, with a test that we didn't, we didn't realize existed. Never in our minds did we realize the test for being men was waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go deer hunting, and you don't actually become a man until you actually kill the buck in this guy's mind. Now, there's all kinds of tests that people face in life. Some of which we know are approaching. Your, drive, your driving test. You know that's coming up. And so you spend all this time growing up, getting excited. You get your learner's permit, and you go through the process, and then you get to take the test in order to drive. 
We understand that if you want to pursue college after, after high school, you have to study for the ACT or the SAT, depending on where you want to go to school, maybe for both, and that there's a test that's, that's approaching. We understand that after you're married and your wife says, honey, load the dishwasher, and then goes out shopping with her friends, when she arrives home, four bags in her hands, there's going to be a test of whether or not you loaded the dishwasher. We just understand that there are going to be some tests in life that are guaranteed. But sometimes there's tests that we don't understand. And this morning what we see is we're all engaged in a test that much like I and the four guys that I was with when we were approached by a stranger in Mississippi, we didn't even understand we were engaged in. And so if you're just joining us today, we're so glad that you're here. We're in the middle of something called It's All About Love, and we're looking at, at the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which were written by one of Jesus' best friends in life, by a guy, believe it or not, named John. And so this morning, we're continuing that in 1st John 4, where if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along, and if not, it'll be on the screens where we read this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Now, we are exposed all the time to so many messages. We are constantly exposed to so many messages, whether it be the forms of media that we consume, whether, whether it be the schools that we go to, whether it be the friends that we have. We are just all consumed to so many messages. And we live in a time right now where some people are like, well, that's okay for you. That's your truth. But this is my truth. And that makes absolutely no sense because truth is truth. And it, it's not something that you get to, f- get to define. Truth doesn't really care about your feelings, right? It's, 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 it's factually based. And so there's no, such con- there's no such idea as your truth or my truth. There is the truth. And there, there's, there are things that are wrong, but it's, it's that simple. It's not your truth or my truth. It's just simply the truth. And it doesn't matter whether I adopt it or whether you adopt it. It doesn't change the fact that that which is true is true, and that which isn't true isn't true. Our, whether or not we adhere to it doesn't, doesn't determine that outcome. Truth is truth. And what we're told is this. This is the test. This is the test in all the messages that were given. This is the test. We can boil it down very simply to this. What does it say about Jesus? What does it say about Jesus? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. There's the test. You can boil it down and at its core, if you want to discover, if you want to discern that which is true, you must discover what the conclusion is drawn about Jesus. And this is something that some people struggle with because at its core, Christianity is an exclusive message. It's exclusive. We want to be inclusive in that it's available to all. We want to be inclusive in that we love everyone. We want to be inclusive in that we want everyone to feel welcome, regardless of where they are in life, regardless of the choices that they're making. We want people to feel inclusive in that they are welcome. And yet, at our core, understand this, we are willing to offend you because we have an exclusive message. Because Jesus said, I'm the only way to God. It's me or nothing. And so we are willing to offend when it comes to this. Because it is not loving to point people in the wrong direction. It is not loving to see people headed in the wrong direction and to do nothing because we're worried about their feelings. That is not love. That is irresponsibility. And so we are going to be people who, yes, love everyone. But part of loving people is loving them enough to share with them the truth. Part of loving people is loving people enough to have the difficult conversations that some people would never want to have with people. But that is love. Think about it. Growing up, there are times that your parents, if you, if you had good parents, there are times that your parents had to tell you things that you didn't want to hear. 
But if they didn't tell you those things, you would end up dead or in jail. And, and maybe you did end up in jail because you didn't listen. But they were there trying to tell you, hey, this is, this is what you need to know. Why do they do that? Because they love to make you miserable? No. If they're good parents, no. They do that because it's something that you need to hear. That's love. Love is being willing to have the hard conversation. Love is being willing to tell people what they don't want to hear, but what they need to hear. And in this age of plurality, we as people who follow Jesus have an exclusive message and that there's only one way to God, there's only one hope, and it's Jesus. That's it. Little children, you are from God and you have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And because we live with an exclusive message in times that just celebrate inclusiveness more than anything else, and because we live in an era where everybody wants to be able to define their own truth, whether or not it's actually true, just understand this, as a follower of Jesus, there is going to be tension in your life. Just understand it and be ready for it. Now, that doesn't mean you walk through life being a jerk, and it doesn't mean you walk through life trying to offend everybody, and it doesn't mean you walk around just being offensive and in your face to everybody that you encounter, and it doesn't mean that you have to be argumentative. But understand that for some people who want to define their own truth that you love very deeply and you're willing to say, well, here's the problem with your worldview. There's going to be tension. And this is why we discovered just, just a couple weeks ago that not everybody's going to love us, and, and we shouldn't think that they are because we saw that not everybody loved God. Right? We've already been told, don't be surprised when the world hates you because the world first hated Jesus. And so we just have to understand that we're going to live lives as people who follow Jesus that are full of tension. And the question that, that we then have to deal with is how do we manage those tensions? How do we manage those tensions? Because they're going to exist. So what do we do as a result of those tensions existing in our lives? How do we conduct ourselves? Well, we're going to see that answer. Beloved, let's love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So, we live in a world where not everybody can be right, but everybody wants to be right. We live in a world where everybody wants to define their own truth, and yet that flies in the very face of that which is true. We live in a world that hated God first, and we follow God, who the world hated. We live in a world where we're faced with tension. So what do we do? We love. We love. If you've ever seen the, the sign on, on the stores when you, when you walk in, what's it say? No shirt, no shoes, no service. Like, we don't care if you're worth $2.5 million. If you walk in here with no shirt, we're not going to serve you. They have standards. They, they, they have decided that's their policy. That when you shop in the store, you have to wear a shirt, you have to wear shoes. In order to get service, you have to wear your shirt and you have to have on a pair of shoes. 
boil this message down very simply, and this is the message. No love, no God. No love, no God. There's no love in your life. You don't have God in your life. And it doesn't matter what you think in your mind. It doesn't matter whether you can quote scripture chapter and verse. It doesn't matter what you've convinced yourself of. This is the test. This is the test. How you love one another. If there is not love in your life, then God is not present in your life. And these are the effects of love. We get to see the impact of love. Here's the effects of love. That Jesus came so we could live. Jesus came so we could live. God loved us so much that in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of us saying, God, I know better than you and I'm going to do things my way, forget your way. It's just, it's going to be up to me. I'm going to do what I want to do. In spite of that, God loved us anyway so much that he sent his son to pay the price for my sin so that my relationship with the very God that I rebelled against could be restored. That is, that is the first effect of love, that Jesus came to save and redeem me and you. Not because we deserve it. We literally have nothing to offer God. We have nothing to give him in this equation. He gives us everything. Why? Because he first loved us. We are to love Because God first loved us. When we had nothing to offer him, he gave us everything. So the first effect of love is that we love God. Realizing what God has done for us. And when we realize what God has done for us, we can't help but do anything else other than love him. We love each other. As a result of being filled with love, as a result of being mindful of that which God has done for us, it is a natural expression then that we go and we love one another. Having been changed, having been, having been just completely altered as a result of God's love for us, we now are people who naturally and tangibly love one another because of what God has done for us. And check this out. This is what is so crazy and what is so exciting and yet what is an incredible responsibility. We display God. We display God. The God that is unseen. We have the obligation to make seen. How? And how we love each other. This thought of this invisible God that that we serve. Romans 1 tells us that that by, by nature, when we look outside and when we see the incredible tapestry that God has designed and created, that it reveals His qualities. And here we see in 1 John 4 that we are to be people who love each other so that in that love we reveal the invisible qualities of the God we serve. That is an incredible responsibility that we are to be the picture of the God who is unseen in how we love one another. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears 
has not been perfected in love. So we see the effects of love continued, that love provides security. Love provides security. We know that we abide in God. We know that we abide in God. Love provides security. It provides an urgency to share that they have seen and they testify. And so I know that this idea can freak people out because they're like, I, I don't really, I'm not, I'm not really good with words, or I, I just, I, I don't know what to say in terms of spiritual conversations. And don't make this more difficult than it has to be. Just share your story. That is the starting point. Share with people what God has done in your life. Share with people how, how God has changed you. Share with people all that God has done for you. That is the starting point. And then point people to Jesus and let God take over and do the rest, but just be willing to share with people what God has done in, through, around, and in spite of you in your own life. Don't make this more complicated than it has to be, but be willing to share with people your story. It gives us, love gives us confidence that we don't have to live in fear. That there is no fear of what's to come. There is no fear of all the mistakes that I've made that I'm going to encounter the wrath of God. Instead, Jesus encountered the wrath of God on my behalf so that when I stand before God, He doesn't see all of my stupid decisions. He doesn't see all of my failures. He doesn't see all of my shortcomings, of which there are many. What He sees when He looks at me is not all of that sin. What He sees is salvation because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And we can live boldly and with confidence in our lives, not having to be people who live in fear, not being people who constantly have to be worried about all of the things in our past. But we can have confidence because Jesus took care of it and he paid the price on our behalf. When we had nothing to offer God, God gave us everything. And we can live as people with confidence and we do not have to live in fear. He's made us perfect in God's sight. The first night that we brought my youngest child home from the hospital, it was cold in Ohio. Probably a September day here in Wisconsin. <laughs> but it was about 38 degrees that night. So I went in and I turned the heat on. And wouldn't you know it, the very first night that Dean is home from the hospital, the heater doesn't kick on. And I'm panicked. And I'm running around and I'm grabbing every blanket I could find. And I stole his brother's security blanket, right, from his older brother which is monogrammed because we had Ethan when we were in the South and everything is monogrammed in the South. It's a sign of love. All right. And we were just throwing blankets on this kid. And I'm on the phone like panicking. I'm talking to any 24-hour heating and cooling service. Finally, I was able to FaceTime somebody and they looked at the problem and they're like, you got a lighter? I'm like, yeah. They're like, light the pilot light. That took care of it. <laughs> Thanks. You know, this blanket has never left Dean's side since. And I know what you're thinking. It's monogrammed with Ethan's initials. But I'm just a parent. I'm not a grandparent, all right? And when you're a grand, like I remember, I remember growing up, we would have breakfast for dinner. And I'd be like, hey, Dad, can we get some orange juice? Be like, we got water, son. You're fine. With my kids, they're like, can we get some orange juice, Baba? He's like, well, there's no orange juice in the fridge, but we got some oranges over on the counter. Let me squeeze some for you kids. I'm like, who is this man? Like, the man would not stop and buy me a jug of orange juice when it's on the way home, when I found out we were having breakfast for dinner, and now that he's a grandfather, he's walking over, peeling oranges, and freshly squeezing them, because my kids are like, Baba, can we have some orange juice? I'm like, 
this is not the same man. I don't know what happened to him. So if I was a grandparent, I would have every kid have their own security blanket monogram for them. But I'm just a parent. And you know what? Ethan's at the age. He doesn't need this anymore. His little brother can have it. That's fine. He's two. Get over your security blanket, kid. The world's tough. You'll figure it out. I mean, it's true. You might as well find out sooner rather than later. My four-year-old still drags this around with him everywhere he goes in the house. In fact, he saw me bringing it here this morning to show it to all of you, and he tried to rip it out of my hands. And I'm like, oh, son, you're 10 years away from that tug of war even being, even being a contest. And then you've never seen the rage like the rage in daddy's eyes when he thinks he's going to lose to a teenager. So that's not happening. Now... I don't know if you had a security blanket. I don't know if your kids had a security blanket. Mine did. Mine still love blankets. Last year, when we asked them what they wanted for Christmas, they each asked for like four new blankets. We're like, really, we do have blankets, and we do have heat in our home, and we do have pajamas for them. They're okay. They just, they love blankets. They love to bury themselves under them. They love to pull them up close. Because it makes them feel secure. I noticed when a big storm was coming not too long ago, this is what my son was holding on to. Because it feels like under this, nothing can get him. Now we look at this and we're like, well, that's. Not very thick, buddy. You're going to be in some real trouble if you're counting on this. And yet we all have a security blanket that is something we can truly count on. That when the storms in our lives come, we can hide. And it really will protect us. When the thoughts of our shortcomings come and plague our minds and we fight this war and we just want to sleep and yet all the mistakes of our past keep coming in HD and they're just flashing in our mind. It's thought after thought after thought and there's things invading our minds that we can't get rid of and we know in our heart that aren't true and yet we're just fighting this war within ourselves that we feel like we can talk to nobody about. We have security in Jesus. When this world tells us that we're not enough, when it tells us that we'll never measure up, when it tells us that we're a failure, when all of our dreams, when everything that we have pursued comes crashing down, we have security in Jesus. When our health fails us and death is on our doorstep and we are staring down our final hours and we are losing our fight. We have security. And it's Jesus. There is no fear in love. The price has been paid. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so Lakeside, this is our challenge. We must live a life of love. God loved us. He gave us everything. When we had nothing to offer him, he gave us everything. And now we are called to love each other and in our love reveal the invisible qualities of God. To live a life of love. Be people who gives the benefit of the doubt. Support each other. Encourage one another. Be generous, but live a life of love. This is what each of us are called to do 
as a result of what God has done for us, as a result of how God's love has impacted us, and this is how we know. When we pass the test, that many of us don't even really realize we're engaged in. Love God. Love each other. It really is that simple. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for each of us. When we had nothing to offer you, you redeemed us. When we rebelled against you, you loved us with a love that is perfect drives out fear, gives us security and safety. And so God, we just ask that you would help us really love you. We ask that you would help us love one another. We ask, God, that we would be people who encourage and support each other. Who are generous with what you've given us. And who know how to balance this tension in the world in which we live. To be people who speak the truth, but to, be, but to do so in love. To be people who are filled with grace and mercy while loving people enough to point them in the direction of that which is true. God, help us love. And we ask that you would just utilize these efforts for your glory. And you would do some incredible things in the lives of our friends and our neighbors our co-workers, and even our enemies. Work in our hearts, in our lives. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.